Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Malik Pancholi. I'm the co-founder of Act to Change. Um, thank you all for joining us. I, I'm just going to actually give it a minute here because I see the participant number kind of scrolling up. And we had, as of yesterday, we had over 900 plus RSVPs. So I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to um, filter in before we actually uh, get started. So I'll just give it a second here. Um, again, just thank you all for joining. We're just kind of waiting because all the participants are um, sort of filtering in and we had over 900 RSVPs. So we want to make sure everyone can kind of get on before we, we, get, we get started here. It just takes a minute. <clears throat> For those of you just joining, I just wanted to let you all know that we're just giving it a couple minutes here to let all the participants uh, uh, filter in. Uh, we had like over 900 RSVPs, so it just takes a little bit uh, of time for me to kind of log, log in really fast. All right, so you know what, since, uh, since, since we're all here, we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Malik Pancholi. I'm the co-founder of Act to Change. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as I said before, we have over 900 RSVPs, so I know people are still uh, filtering in. So just, just to, um, just to uh, be cognizant of our time today, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. But this is our first in a series of what we're calling COVID convos that we're planning to host. We're hoping then to do them potentially on a weekly basis, um, but definitely on an ongoing basis. So thank you so much for being here, but this is definitely our first one. It's our first time organizing a virtual panel with people all over the country with 900 plus guests all over the country. So um, we're streaming it to Facebook Live. So there'll be some additional people watching it that way. So please bear with us as we figure out this whole new format of holding these kinds of panels. Um, together. Just to do a little bit of general housekeeping, if you guys have thoughts that you want to share throughout this conversation, uh, feel free to use the chat function. Um, and that's actually a good way for you to have conversations amongst yourselves. But if you have questions that you want to direct at the panelists who I'm about to introduce, uh, use the Q&A feature. And that will be moderated by someone at Act to Change. We're going to do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Um, we only have an hour here today, so I'm not sure that we'll be able to get to all of them, but we will try to get to, to as many as we can. So we all know that with the outbreak of COVID-19, um, the coronavirus, it, it's brought with it devastating consequences. At this point, we all probably know somebody who's fallen ill or sadly even somebody who might have passed away. We know that our healthcare workers and hospital, uh, hospitals are in great need of our help right now. And we know that so many people have been put out of work. Uh, another horrific part of this disease is that because the outbreak started in China, it has wrongly brought with it an, un an alarming number of hate crimes, violence, and incidents of bullying being directed at our Asian American uh, community. So we're here today to talk about ways that we can address that. Um, we hope that our talk here today will give all of you joining, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a student, or a community member, uh, some real takeaways for open discussions that you can continue to have, and for real ways to rise above uh, the bullying and the hate. 
Um, as I said before, we have some amazing panelists here today. I'm going to introduce them to you in just a minute, but I wanted to give you all a little bit of background on Act to Change. So our mission here at Act to Change is very simple. It's to end bullying against Asian American and Pacific Islander youth and to foster a world where young people can celebrate their differences. Act to Change was first founded as a White House campaign in 2015. I was serving on President Barack Obama's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And myself and the staff at the White House Initiative on AAPIs, we were seeing that AAPI kids were being bullied at shocking rates, sometimes at double the national average and also in very unique ways for their appearance, for the languages they spoke, uh, for their English proficiency, for their accents, for the foods they brought to school, for their perceived immigration status, for their religion, and also for intersectional reasons like identifying as LGBTQ. And there was not a campaign speaking to these specific needs. Uh, now this was back in 2015, and there was already a need for a campaign like this. In 2017, when the administration turned over, there was a rise in anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment, and our work sadly became more important. And now in 2020, with the advent of the coronavirus and the increase in bullying against Asian Americans, our work is even more important again. So I just wanna highlight a few of the news stories and um, the kinds of incidents that have been happening. And I think we might have a couple of slides to share with you all. Um, an Asian teen in California was sent to the emergency room after he was bullied and assaulted and accused of having the coronavirus. A 23-year-old woman in New York City had to go to the hospital after she was punched in the face by attackers invoking anti-Asian slurs. A man sprayed an Asian passenger on the New York City subway with Febreze and verbally abused him. The FBI recently put out a report warning of a surge in hate crimes against Asian Americans. They included the story of a six-year-old and a two-year-old being stabbed. The suspect thought they were Chinese and that they were infecting others with the virus. We also have reports of Asian Americans not being allowed to go into stores, not being picked up by Ubers or Lyfts, being told not to come to work. And Asian American businesses like restaurants are seeing a sharper decline than other businesses are seeing. Um, the online reporting forum, Stop AAPI Hate, has received more than 1,000 direct reports of discrimination against Asian Americans since it launched on March 17th. So we're gonna talk about um, all of this today. I wanna to introduce you to uh, our amazing panelists. We are very, very lucky uh, to be joined today by actor Hudson Yang. Um, hey, Hudson. <laughs> you all uh, know him and you fell in love with him over the six seasons that he played Eddie Huang on ABC's Fresh Off the Boat. Um, we also are very lucky to have with us Congresswoman Grace Feng. Uh, she represents New York's sixth district. She is the first um, Asian American to be elected to Congress from New York. She's a member of the House Ethics and Appropriations Committees and she is the vice chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. And I just wanna say personally, um, Congresswoman Meng, I've seen you all over the news in the last few weeks, really standing up for our communities. Uh, I know that you've been working so hard to protect all New Yorkers and all Americans with the stimulus bill. So I know that you're extremely busy and just thank you so much for, um, for being here uh, today. Um, I don't know if we have Dr. Vivek Murthy just yet. Um, I wonder if someone can help me out here and let me know. I'm gonna see. Um, I'm not sure that he's here, but I know he's joining. Uh, hopefully he'll be joining us very shortly. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Vivek Murthy is the 19th Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, he was appointed by President Barack Obama. He is the first ge uh, Surgeon General of Indian descent, uh, the founder of Doctors for America, and he's the author of a new book, called Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes uh, Lonely World, which comes out later this month. So um, just to get us started, I listed off a number of these news stories, but I wanna ask all of you how the coronavirus has impacted you uh, directly. And Hudson, maybe we could start with you. You know, we're so lucky to have you here because um, Act to Change really focuses on young people and you've been a role model to so many, uh, so many young people in general, but certainly so many AAPI youth 
as well. And I'm sure there are a lot of kids uh, who are tuning in who'd love to hear from you. So I'd love to hear how the how this virus has impacted you directly. And then I know that uh, your family recently endured a hate incident. So I'm wondering if, if that's something that you could, could share with us. Yeah, um, well, the coronavirus it hasn't like super affected me directly, right? Besides the fact that, you know, we're all in lockdown, we're all stuck inside. Um, one thing is that like children are not really at risk as much as adults really. So I didn't, I wasn't really as worried about the disease affecting me rather than my family. Um, but like family wise, we're stuck inside. My dad um, like can't go to work. No one can go to work. And also my mom, um, ooh, my mom is a doctor, right? And so she's working on the same floor as all the coronavirus patients and they don't have enough supplies, right? So I think they got one mask for the whole day every day or something like that. Um, wow. And so it's just like kind of scary, right? Cause like I'm worried about my parents cause they're like older and they're also more at risk. And then also just like going outside to get like food and like essentials every time is scary as well. Not just because of the disease, because also because of people, like my dad was in line, I think it was at like Trader Joe's or something. And like this person came up to him, like, I think, I, I don't remember exactly what happened, but like he like yelled at my dad and like told him like, get out of the store because like a danger to size and like cough in his face. And it was just like horrible. Like, I don't know why people do it. It doesn't, it doesn't help anything or change anything by like, attacking or hurting people but yeah yeah actually i mean i read a little bit about what your dad posted online about um you know having i think some slurs yelled at him and then the person literally as you said tried to cough on him as you know as though like trying to make him sick if he wasn't maybe or you know i'm right. not even sure what doesn't make sense what that meant. Yeah. but i'm curious you know like so when something like that happens to someone that you love or you care about um, like, how did that, how did that make you feel? Like, what were the, what were the conversations you had at home around how to even process that? I mean, of course I was angry. Uh, like I wasn't there cause my dad didn't want me to go outside. So I was at home and he just mm -hmm. came back and like told me about the story and I was upset. Cause I feel like, I don't know if things would have been different if I was there It would probably be worse cause I'm a kid, mm -hmm. but like, I just kind of felt like almost like hopeless and useless. Right. And so I didn't know what to do. And it's kind of like, you don't really like, think that like stuff like this happens to people you know until it actually just does and I was just baffled that there are really people outside to do that it's, it's awful um yeah yeah I know I mean I know that your your dad was pretty vocal about it on social mm -hmm. media but did you guys do any other um kind of reporting or um you know like putting it out into the real world and in any, any other ways outside of social media I don't think we he reported it to like any of the call lines like the hotlines uh, I don't think so. I think he just kind of talked about Instagram and, and gave us like, he gave us all a lecture about like staying safe and whatever, but he never yeah. really passed that, I don't think. Just what you want to hear, a lecture about st <laughs> staying safe. Yeah, exactly. I, um, yeah. I, I just want to share while we're talking about this that um, at acttochange.org, we have compiled a list of places that you can report hate crimes to. And some of them are places that are collecting data just to have data for, for future. And some of those places are actually like, hotlines um, like FBI.gov and the New York, uh, I think New York has a hotline now on where the New York uh, Hate Crimes Task Force will investigate hate crimes. So um, there are uh, things that people can do um, to report it. I just want to um, really quickly welcome Dr. Morthy. I see that you've joined us. Thank you so much for um, being here. Uh, I already gave a brief intro on you, but we're, we're so lucky to have you and the things that you're talking about around um, uh, loneliness and human connection in a time when we're all very isolated, I think is uh, just so important. So thank you for making the time um, time to be here. Uh, we were just talking with Hudson about a particular incident that happened to his dad, but we, we kind of listed a bunch of the incidences of racism and hatred that have been happening toward our community. And I kind of want to put out to everybody and Congresswoman Meng um, to you as well. What What is the most direct impact that COVID-19 has had on on your life? So nothing um, discriminatory has happened to me directly, except for some, you know, random typical Facebook comments. Um, but, you know, it's something that I've been hearing a lot about from people around the country, including my own constituents. People are really scared. People are asking, you know, you know, what are the hate crime laws and how do we protect ourselves? And these are 
coming from, you know, anyone who are from new immigrants, newer Americans, to people who've been here for two generations, maybe. And for the first time, for an extended period of time, they feel scared. I have a friend's um, mom who's Korean American who is literally scared to go outside and to go to the grocery store because she's afraid that she might be verbally attacked again. And what are, um, what are the kinds of things that you, you are saying in response to that? What, like, how do you, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, we've been trying to highlight it in the media, specifically, specifically the ethnic media. We want the community to know that this type of behavior is not okay, that Chinese Americans, Asian Americans are just as American as anyone else, and we don't have to prove otherwise. Um, so it's important for me to remind people that we are American and it's not okay to treat people like this, whether it's verbal or physical. So we're just encouraging people to report these incidents if they are happening, because we also need those statistics. If we complain to, you know, um, law enforcement, um, we have, they have to see that there are incidents that are being happening. Uh, reported uh, and that are happening. Otherwise, we can't get uh, resources to help us. And so, I mean, you know, the, the reason all this uh, is happening in the first place is that because this outbreak started in China, and you know, this is maybe my opinion, maybe fact, <laughs> but but we had you know so many so many journalists and so many politicians from the top down insisting on calling it the Chinese virus or calling it the Wuhan virus. And you've been particularly outspoken in, in talking about why that's, why that's wrong and why we need to change that rhetoric. And um, you know, I imagine a lot of people on our call are, are, are pretty aware of that, but for those people who are tuning in who might not know why, can you just explain in you know, most basic terms why it's wrong to call it that and, and why we need to change that, that rhetoric? Sure. A long time ago, we did describe and name diseases by how they began. Um, but uh, in 2015, the World Health Organization, a global organization, gave out guidance saying that we don't do that anymore. Um, for example, back then we had the swine flu and we don't call it by animals or describe it by the country of origin. This is because of the harmful and potential negative impacts that it could have on our communities. Um, and so, you know, for example, uh, when the swine flu came about, um, the, the farming industry was disproportionately harmed. So I've also heard the same thing from Dr. Fauci to the CDC to the Secretary of Health, who all agree that we should not name it the Chinese virus or Kung flu, for example. Um, and, and so I know that you've introduced a resolution into the House, and I think you had um, at the outset, and I don't know if this is this is this number's gone up, but I know at the outset I think there were over 130 uh, co-sponsors um, to denounce anti-Asian sentiment caused by the coronavirus. So, can you just explain what exactly um, that kind of legislation does, and and the real impact that that might have on people who are experiencing um, hate crimes? Sure. Recently, I introduced a resolution uh, in the House. I thought it was important that the United States Congress uh, stood united and stood strong and publicly condemn anti-Asian American sentiment, especially in relation to COVID-19. Um, within a few hours, we had over 130 colleagues, Congress members, sign on as a show of support. And we're still, I haven't checked recently, but we're still continuing to uh, have people sign on. Um, and this basically, number one, stand strong and united against hate. Uh, number two, ask the federal government to make sure that we are allocating and collecting resources so that we know to what extent this is happening. Are we collecting the stories? Are we collecting the numbers so we can see how widespread and harmful uh, of an impact that this might have? And, and with like a legislation like that, is there stuff that we... Um, as citizens can be doing to support that kind of legislation? Like, should we be writing a representative? Should we be 
you know, putting something online about how we were in support of a resolution like this, or what are the real things that we can be doing to engage with our representatives? representatives sure, right that's, that's always helpful. So we are encouraging people to reach out to their own uh, Congress members and Senate too. The Senate now has a version. It's been introduced by Senators uh, Harris, uh, Hirono, and Duckworth. Um, and so we want our elected officials to sign on. And even look, even if you call and they've already signed on, um, it's very important for elected officials to hear from everyday people in our districts. And so that would be a show of support, even if they have already signed on. We can just call and say thank you or just email super quick. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Murthy, I want to I want to bring you into the conversation, too. I am. Um, you know, I'd love to hear how, what the most direct impact the COVID-19 has had on your life. But then also, I just want to, you know, in sort of building on what we were talking about with Congresswoman Meng, I know a lot of us are feeling isolated right now, where a lot of us are feeling alone. We also, a lot of us want to help um, and don't know real ways to do that. And I know that, I know that in your book, which I'd love to hear you talk about a little bit, you're talking about the importance of human connection and how to deal with isolation. So, um, I'd love to just, if you can just talk about some of the real consequences that, that we might be experiencing with this um, increase in feeling loneliness and isolation. Sure. Well, thanks, Malik. And, and it's really nice to be here with both of you, with Hudson, with uh, Congresswoman Meng, and, uh, and good to see your face again as well, Malik. Uh, you know, I think you know, this is an incredibly hard time, I think, for everyone, because number one, like our country and the world really have not seen a pandemic like this in over a century. So no one's alive now uh, who actually has real, you know, strong memories uh, of, of that time. And we're also being asked to do something that's extraordinarily unnatural, which is to physically distance ourselves from other people. As it is before all of this began, we knew that levels of loneliness were quite high in the United States and also in many other countries around the world. When I say quiet high, I don't mean like maybe 0.5%, 1%. I mean that even if you look at more conservative uh, surveys, and I don't mean conservative in terms of politics, I mean methodologically conservative, uh, that the percentage of adults in the U.S. who register as being lonely is around 22%. So, And there are many surveys which put that number higher, but even if it's 22%, that's more adults than have diabetes in this country. That's more adults than struggle. Uh, with smoking in this country. It's a lot of people. And the other thing that's really important to understand is how consequential loneliness is, that it's strongly associated with an increased risk of heart disease and dementia and depression and anxiety and sleep disturbances, and even a shortening of lifespan. So is, why do I mention this? But because I think for a long time, we have taken our social interactions and relationships for granted. You know, we all, I think most of us would say, if asked, you know, what are our top three priorities in life, we'd probably name a person. Maybe it's our child or our spouse or a parent or family member. Um, but if you look at how society, I think, pushes us uh, to live our lives and prioritize our time, if you look at how society defines success, success is not measured by the quality of your relationships. Success is measured by how much you're able to acquire of one of three things, and that's wealth, power, or reputation. Right. And so as a result, you know, from a young age, uh, we're sort of driven to put our energy toward the acquisition of, of those three things. Now, acquiring wealth, power and reputation are not wrong. But the question is, where do they fall in relation to our relationships, uh, into our human connections? And I think that one of the consequences of this experience we're all going through with COVID-19 uh, is it could take us in one of two directions. One is it could deepen our loneliness uh, by physically separating us from each other. And people who are lonely may become lonelier and people who weren't lonely may actually start to struggle with it. But I think there's another path that we could take, which is that we could use this opportunity to recognize something I think that many people are waking up to, which is a recognition of how extraordinarily important their human connections are in their life. Uh, being able to see a friend, being able to spend time um, with family in person. These are, these are core to who we are. It's not just a nice to have, and this is a really, I think a central point is that in our baked into our biology over thousands of years of evolution is the need to be connected to each other. It's actually essential for our survival. And that's why when you feel lonely, it's not because you're somehow deficient socially. You feel lonely for the same reason you feel hungry or thirsty. 
because your body senses that you're lacking something that you need for survival. And if you fill that need, then the loneliness goes away. If it continues for a long period of time, it becomes chronic. And that's when we worry about the health consequences. So my feeling is that if we use this moment to refocus on our relationships, um, to recommit to our relationships, and to take a few concrete steps and make sure that we keep relationships in our life, then I do think we can come out stronger. And some of those concrete steps are that, like, number one, if we just make sure that we're spending 15 minutes a day during this time connecting with someone we love, whether that's video conferencing with them so we can see their face and hear their voice, or whether that's calling them or writing to them to just say, hey, I was thinking of you and wanted to make sure you're okay. That small amount of time can make you feel good in the moment and can be quite powerful in the long term. You know, second, you can also focus on the quality of the time you're spending with people. You know, we have the ability to multitask like no uh, one before us, right? But thanks to technology. Uh, but the, the sort of double-edged sword of multitasking is it can actually distract us from our conversations. And now we might convince ourselves, I can listen while I'm also typing at the same time or while I'm scrolling through my Instagram feed or, or whatever it might be. But science is actually very clear in telling us that when we think we're multitasking, what we're really doing is we're switching between tasks very rapidly. So we're not actually fully paying attention to someone when they're talking. But this is a moment where we can say, okay, the time I'm going to spend with my friend or family member, let me just have that be time with them. Let me put away distractions and devices and other things. And even if that means I can spend less time with them, let it be high quality time. And finally, and I would say, Malik, like the, the third thing I want to mention that I think can be very helpful during this time is actually reaching out to help each other. It turns out that acts of service are a powerful antidote to loneliness. And the, part of the reason is that when we become lonelier and lonelier over time, we paradoxically, we turn inward when we actually start to focus more on ourselves and our threat level also shifts. So we start to see threat more readily around us. And that might sound weird. Why is that? If we're lonely, shouldn't we actually reach out to other people uh, and focus more on them as opposed to us? And the reason it makes sense is thousands of years ago, if you were lost on the tundra and separated from your tribe, you, you knew that your chances of survival suddenly dropped. You were more likely to be attacked by a predator or die of starvation. So your threat level raised because you wanted to perceive even something that could be a minor, had a minor chance of being a threat. You wanted to perceive that as a threat because your life depended on it. And your focus turned inward because that's how you survived. If you had a small nick or a cut or something, you wanted to be able to, to notice that to protect and preserve yourself. But in modern day society, when we have an excessive focus on self and we're suspicious of folks around us, and when we're chronically lonely, we also start to believe that the reason we're lonely is that we're not likable or we're not, not lovable. So it, it chips away at our self-esteem. So the reason service is so powerful is that it helps to break that negative cycle, shifts the focus off of us to someone else in the context of a positive experience and it reaffirms for us that we have value to add to the world. So finally, if we think about all these things together, what they teach us and what they help me uh, rem remember is that as difficult a moment as this is, that if we are intentional about sustaining and nurturing our relationships, if we come out of this with a renewed commitment to prioritizing people in our life, then I think we may be able to emerge from this whole COVID-19 ordeal with a stronger foundation than when we entered it. That's amazing. I'm, I mean, I'm so curious about so many things that you spoke about in that. I mean, one of the things that I'm thinking about is um, uh, apart from these things that we can do in isolation, um, what happens, for example, like I know one of the biggest things that's happening right now with isolation is this is that no one can go to school and Hudson maybe maybe you can speak to this too so we have all these kids you know zooming into classrooms potentially and actually Hudson I think you have a class in like a half an hour I know so um, I know you're actually literally virtual virtual schooling um, but you know in the school environment you're potentially like maybe in, in Congresswoman Meng's district which I know is very diverse you're being surrounded by diver a diverse student body you're learning about diversity maybe in very real ways um, in this new environment where, where we are isolated and um, not actually interacting with people who might be different than us, um, what are some things that we can do to continue this conversation around diversity and letting young people um, get to know each other? Like, do, I don't know if that, that question makes sense, but for, for them to actually have, you know, I, I heard you talk about having these meaningful conversations, not to be multitasking, but to actually put your focus into them, but how can we sort of bridge the gap so that young people 
um, can have those conversations with each other. And Hudson, feel free to join in. I, I'm so curious, like what the what the homeschooling situation um, looks like. I zoomed in to a classroom a few days ago to talk to the classroom, and I actually found it very difficult to have meaningful um, connections. You know, there were so many kids on the screen, a hand would go up and then they'd freeze and you'd be like, do you have a question? Do you have a question? <laughs> and, and nothing would come back at you. So how do you form those meaningful uh, connections in isolation? And I guess that's open to all of you. I know Congresswoman Meng, I, I can see that your, your child is there. And so I'm sure you're dealing with this as, as a parent and as someone who has someone in school. So I'm curious about what we can do to keep kids connected. Hudson, you want to start us off? I mean, I was just mean, like my personal experience, like the online like schooling, it basically puts like it puts a lot of trust into the kids. Right. And so if you look online, you see a lot of jokes about kids basically just you can put up a fake screen of yourself sitting there. You don't actually have to go to class. Right. And so what it does is it, it allows you to cheat and allows you to like not focus on classes and then not being in school no longer forces you to like be socially interactive. Right. So a lot of people like that I talked to in my old school or at school before it became online are talking about how instead of like talking to kids and going to class, all they do is kind of open up the calls and look at their in class and play games. Right. And I think like the way that like coronavirus has affected kids the most is the fact that like a lot of people aren't going back to school this year anymore. Right. Like one of my friends, she's a senior and she just found out that one, she's not going to be able to like graduate on stage Two, She's not going to see anybody that she saw anymore because they're not going back to school. And like, I think because we're no longer forced to interact with other kids at school, like a lot of the connections and like, um, just like, you know, yeah, a lot of the connections that people have made are kind of like deteriorating because like people don't, don't really care anymore. Yeah, um, I, guess, I guess my question out there is, are there, are there any tips um, for how we can try to get kids to have these meaningful connections when they're not able to see each other in person? Or Congressman Meng, are there things that you're encouraging your your children to do to stay connected to their communities? Sure. Um, thank you for this question. Yeah, it's been an incredibly uh, challenging balancing act uh, having kids at home, and even makes me even more grateful for teachers and school support staff um, who do this every single day. Um, Hudson, I'm glad my kids weren't in the room when you mentioned the idea of the <laughs> fake screen. Oh uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's collective worry from parents everywhere who are on this podcast. Kidding, this, uh, this. I was just okay. kidding. Just kidding, kids. That doesn't work. Um, but you know, like I, I like to try to think of things, see things as glass half full, right? There are a lot of families and a lot of young people who are thinking of ways, whether they're initiating or joining, um, ways to be helpful to their neighbors, to people who might be suffering, people making masks, people literally hanging a, a, a colored, you know, picture that says thank you in their apartment windows here in New York City. And these are ways that our young people are learning from each other and building these connections and alliances that they might not have had um, in a, a normal circumstance. And so however we can share ways that we, especially the young people, are showing acts of kind kindness and acts of uh, service uh, online uh, is very helpful. And our young people are much more skilled at this than, than, you know, most of us. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of room for creativity and we could all benefit from it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with, uh, with what uh, Grace and Hudson were saying. I, I think there is something extraordinarily powerful about engaging in acts of service together. Uh, when you think about people, you know, who may have gone to the Peace Corps together or served in the military together, um, or, you know, gone to college together, left home, you know, and all gone to a new place and, and been educated for four years together. These are really powerful shared experiences. And when you combine a shared experience with a focus on service, it can be all the more powerful for creating bonds. You know, during this time, I think one of the things I, I hear often is that a lot of people say they're just bored. They're just, they can't go out and do the things that they want to do. Um, they can't pay attention to eight hours of class a day. They're just sitting at home and, and they're bored. Um, but to give people something to do uh, that can actually make them feel good in the moment, and the most tangible way to do that is to give them an opportunity to serve, could be powerful. And the thing about service is in the traditional day, we might think, okay, well, services, let's all organize and go to a soup kitchen. Let's all organize and go to a homeless shelter. Obviously, those are harder to do now because we can't go out. But what we can do is we can look around us very locally and just ask, who needs help around us? 
Is it our neighbor uh, who might be elderly and is having trouble going out to get groceries? Um, it might turn out that several of our friends may have elderly folks in their neighborhood who are having a hard time um, you know, getting groceries. So we could work with friends to figure out, okay, we've got three families now who need groceries. How can we collaborate to like, get them groceries? Mm -hmm. There are simple things like that that we can, we can do to serve. And I think one of the great you know, advantages of doing that is that this moment, I think, is forcing us to think a lot more locally than we normally do, to look at the people around us and to take notice of them anew, uh, to ask what they need. And you know, in normal times, if we're feeling you know, a little off or we're feeling down or we're feeling vulnerable in some way, we may not feel comfortable expressing that to somebody else you know, because we might think, yeah, they, their lives seem perfect. Everything seems to be going great for them. I don't want to be the one who's saying, like, I'm struggling. But I can tell you that right now, everybody is struggling to some extent, whether it's you know, people like me and Grace who are trying to figure out what to do with our kids and how to keep them occupied and you know, avoid killing each other, or whether we're trying <laughs> to figure out how to make sure that they're educated or how to take care of our elderly parents or how to work and homeschool at the same time. Like Everybody is struggling. And so I think when we reach out to each other, recognizing that common vulnerability that we have at this moment, it also allows us to deepen our relationships more quickly and so I would encourage uh, you know, people, kids, adults as well, to, to, to keep that in mind because as you, the risk that you normally feel when you're open with somebody about how you're doing, I think is less uh, during this period than it normally would be because we all are actually struggling. Yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. It's, you, you know, I, I keep think, feel like the, a repeated theme about how we can stay connected to communities I just want to highlight is, is being of service. And, you know, and then it sounds like, uh, I know for myself and I know for so many people that there's a real desire to do that. I know, you know, so many people are doing online things where it's like, if you participate in something, they'll make a donation or, you know, they'll send you a video or, um, um, and so I kind of, I kind of want to, I want to just pivot here for a second to the fact that we're all online. We're all online, like all the time now. I mean, I, I used to sort of be addicted to Instagram anyway, and now I can't stop. <laughs> now I can't stop looking at it. And so um, but online is also where a lot of this hate is living. You know, for, for example, there was a, a video that I don't really want to, um, you know, call too much attention to, attention to, but it was on Instagram. It was very racist. Uh, it got a lot of attention. Uh, I went to report it. A number of my colleagues and friends went to report it. And like four days later, I got a message back from Instagram saying like they're overwhelmed right now. And so if I don't want to see the video to block the user. And I just want to put in a, a quick plug that we are, you, we're hoping to make these COVID combos a weekly or, or at least an ongoing series. And we're really looking, um, we've made asks out to some of the social media platforms to talk to their content managers in our next incarnation of this. So hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to announce that soon. But the online bullying is, um, it's very complex. You know, one thing that I think about is if a, if a bullying incident happens at school, where others can see it, there might be a friend who comes to you afterwards and says, I'm sorry that happened, or who might st stand up for you in the moment. But what happens when you're home alone and you see something that makes you feel bad? You know, what are the additional layers that isolation brings to it? What, you know, the, the, the shame, the fear, that maybe you don't express it to someone and, and you internalize those things. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And also, you know, um, Hudson, you know, for example, I imagine that you're finding yourself online a lot. Are you seeing incidences there? Are you able to build communities online where you guys can support each other? Um, and for, for Dr. Murthy and Congresswoman Meng, you know, how do you, what are things that you do to make that online time safe for the young people in your lives? I'll throw that, that out to anyone who knows a lot of questions there um, all at once. Okay, well, you know, just to start off Hudson, are you, as someone who is online and who probably has a lot of uh, social media friends online who are about your age, like, is there, are you seeing an increased amount of bullying online? I mean, to be fair, when I'm online, I'm not, I'm like also kind of not a great example. I'm not really like talking to anybody, right? I don't use Instagram very often just for like, you know, briefly, like when I want to post something or my dad wants me to post something, I'll be there. When I'm online, all I'm doing is like work or uh, school or like playing a game or something. I don't really like go out of my way to talk with different communities or something like that. But I mean, even just doing that, there is like a notice noticeable amount of like bullying and other sorts of hate that I've noticed. And it's kind of hard to like deal with it because you can't just make them stop. The best you can do is gather together as a like, small group and almost just ignore them. You can't, if you, if you interact with them, 
all you do is increase their want to bully more, right? It's kind of mm-hmm. like the more you ignore them, the less they do it. Uh, yeah, it's like nothing. Uh, a troll online only loves the attention. That's what they're. That's what they're there for in the first place. So yeah, I didn't. Mean I to think the fact that, that it's all online also makes it easier for people to bully because they're not in, in person, right? They don't have anything to be afraid of. They can say whatever they want, and nobody really knows who they are, right? So it just makes it easier for people to say what they want to say and hurt people as much as they want to hurt people. Yeah, and so how? So I'm curious, like as parents. Um, uh uh what what are you guys doing to keep online safe like do you have conversations about it do you do you have ways to keep the the bullying that might happen online um out of isolation and something that you can chat about so i think hudson is right you know it is much easier to bully and to say mean things uh when you're not face to face with someone um and so i do think that it's important my kids are still on the younger side but they have started uh to you know use instagram for example um so just to try to either oversee them or, or at the very least, let your kids know that you are mindful of what they might be reading or, or typing. Um, I, I think that, you know, my kids are in fifth grade and seventh grade, so they're still young enough where I do think that they need supervision and they're still learning the, the um, protocol and um, the etiquette of, of being on social media. And I do think that it is important to talk to your kids even if it's not the deepest you know, conversation, just to let them know that you care. I think that as a daughter of Asian immigrants, it's something that was always difficult for me and I'm sure many other Asian families. And we didn't even have to deal with the, with the online um, uh, issues. Um, but I remember I was telling uh, a first generation uh, dad, I said, look, I think your son has low self-esteem. He might be suffering from some, you know, bullying at school. And the father who meant well, literally did not understand. He said, well, my son has, you know, both feet, both hands, you know, eyes, ears, and nose. So I don't understand why he would have low self-esteem. And I say that not to make fun of this person, but just to show you sort of the mentality uh, or the lack of understanding that a lot of parents might have about what bullying means to them. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, couldn't couldn't agree more. You know, my my kids are also on on the small side. They're, in fact, younger than Grace is. And so I, you know, thankfully now, not in a position where I have to go to go to bat with them about whether to use Instagram or not. But, but I do think two, two points I wanted to, to share. One is um, I think your point, Malik, is really good that because people are indoors a lot, they may be using uh, social media more. I think we're all using technology across the board a lot more. One of the reasons I think this is concerning when it comes to social media use in particular is when you look at data around passive use of social media, and by passive, I mean, you're primarily scrolling through your feed, consuming videos, looking at people's comments, maybe liking, uh, you know, their posts, et cetera. But you're not really going out there and having like an engaged conversation with somebody, like posting something, having a discussion, asking somebody for help or connecting to like, you know, and then have a one-on-one conversation later. When you're engaged passively in the use of social media, it has been shown to be associated with more depression and loneliness. And so I do worry uh, about people who are passively you know, consuming social media more now than they may have been before. I think, you know, while I think it would be wonderful if we could just automatically dial down uh, the amount of social media usage, we know that it's hard to do in the, in a vacuum. And instead, what you need to do is substitute something for what may have been like five hours of social media use. You need to take up those hours in something that may be equally as enjoyable. And so one thing that I've noticed families doing is actually creating these circles, uh, circles where you'll have a small number uh, of people. It could be two, three, four, five kids. And small is important because you need people to be able to see each other's faces, interact with each other, not really talk over each other and feel like they're in an intimate circle. And so you can have three, four, five um, you know, kids together on sort of a group Zoom, for example, or some other platform. 
And then you can actually engage in activities together. So you could have story time together where you could have one of the parents reading a story and then you've got pictures of the four kids actually listening there and then they could talk about it afterward. You could do music class together. My, my kids actually just this morning had a virtual music class, you know, with their teacher in Washington, D.C. and other students uh, in the class. And I'll tell you, they were actually really engaged uh, by it. We were excited. And for us, it was a substitute to our, <laughs> to our son watching Mickey Mouse videos all the time, which he's obsessed with. <laughs> so this is a much more interactive way to do it. But you can imagine using that kind of platform for various things. So the story time is one, music is another, you could have joint dance, you know, events, you could have kids talking about if you want to actually engage in a service activity together, uh, that could be an opportunity for them to actually get together and plan it out. Hey, how are we going to do this? The reason I mentioned this in particular is you know, right now, I think there's a tendency for people to text much more so than FaceTime with each other if they want to transact things. That's convenient. It's what we do in, in day-to-day life. But what I've noticed actually in my own life is that people are actually FaceTiming and Zooming much more so with video like capability, not just the audio part. And I think it's because they're sort of craving uh, some human connection where you can see people's faces. So I think this is actually a chance for us to reset a little bit with our kids as well, and to get them used to these forums where they can actually see other kids face-to-face, hear their voice. That's not only important because they're not getting it as much now, but also it may help us tilt more toward that kind of in-person interaction even after this is all over. And I hear from a lot of parents who are worried that their, their kids are just not getting, they're not comfortable, you know, with, you know, interacting with people in person. They prefer to have dialogue online because it's just easier to control. You don't have to like worry about what you say in the moment. You might freeze. You can just step back, step back and think about it or not reply at all if you don't feel like, you know, you're comfortable with what somebody said. But we know that real life is about making sure we're comfortable with a range of interactions from online to face-to-face, whether that's virtual or, 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 you know, in real life. And so I think this is a chance for us through these circles to potentially engage in more face-to-face interactions in smaller groups and to substitute for some of the social media time that kids may otherwise engage in. That's incredible, yeah. Um, I just realized we this conversation is so amazing, but I realized that we're um, heading towards the end of the hour. So I wanna make sure that I got to um, a couple of questions from people who have been tuning in. So um, I'm gonna, I'll just go through, through some of these that are being sent to me here. Um, this one's from, uh, uh, I don't, I hope I don't say this wrong, but Carlo Bernardino, um, who says, what should I do or say when someone is saying an anti-Asian slur to me? How should I react? Any thoughts? You know, that answer depends if my children are with me or not. (laughs) (laughs) I remember... Uh, a few months ago, someone walked past me, this is not COVID-19 related, um, and pretended to, you know, speak in Chinese language or, you know, whatnot. Um, and I was immediately angry and I knew it was meant to, to poke fun at me. Um, but my kids who were with me, and I didn't know how I would react because they were with me. Um, my kids, instead of getting angry, they said, oh, wow, mom, he speaks Chinese too. <laughs> So I try to, especially if they're with me, I try to use it as a teaching moment. You know, I said, look, there might be instances where someone genuinely wants to practice their Chinese language or, you know, have questions about our culture. And if it comes from a good place, that's okay. But an example of that person who was sort of mocking us, uh, it did not come from a good place. And, you know, we don't have to curse them or, or stick up your middle finger, anything vulgar. Um, but if possible, I do try to engage them briefly in conversation um, to try to teach. Obviously, usually that is not what they're interested in, but I feel like that's my duty at the very least. Does anyone else wanna, wanna hop in? Um, I, mean, I think it's I can, dangerous I, to respond at all, right? Like when it, when it comes to like, people who are saying those things are not normally very calm people, right? So if someone says a hate slur towards you and you respond, all they're going to do is get more and more intense and mad. And it's really hard to diffuse the situation. So the best thing you can really do is either step away, ignore them. And even if you want to try to have a calm conversation with them, even trying to do that often leads to further dispute and uh, like hate. And I I would, you know, just jump in there and say too that, um, 
you know, if you're alone and something like, like that happens, um, you know, I, I imagine everyone has a different level of comfort around it, as Congressman Meng said and, and Hudson, as you were saying. And, but I would say that in the aftermath of that, I think it's so important to talk about it with somebody else, to share, uh, to share our stories. You know, we've, we've talked so much about the importance of sharing our stories. There's not only, not only is it important to um, report it so that we can have the data around what's actually happening out there, but I also think on an emotional level, um, finding out that you're not alone um, and finding out that, uh, that you have a support network is so important to dealing with things like that um, when that, when that happens. Um, Dr. Murthy, did you want to chime in? Yeah. Too? You know, I think these are, gosh, I mean, there's just uh, such tough situations because in the moment, I mean, I mean, I would feel like grace would feel like, you know, just, you feel a surge of anger right inside you and, and resentment because you know, what's being said is, is wrong. And there's a desire to respond, but I think a couple of things I might consider. Number one is, I would think about your safety. I think safety is important. And if you're alone, and you know there's a group of people who are you know, directing slurs at you, then uh, you got to think of your safety first. And finding some way to just walk away and extract yourself from that situation is essential. The second thing is, I think to Hudson's point, I think people are often when they, it depends a bit on their intention. You know, some people will you know use a racial slur because they're trying to get a rise out of you and they want to to hurt you. Uh, and that happens a lot. And in that case, if you respond to them and show your anger, it it fulfills uh, their their desire. I mean, their 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 objective is is met. Uh, and so, to the extent that you can not respond and walk away in those moments, I think it's important. But on the other hand, there's sometimes there are times that people use racial slurs out of ignorance because they're not necessarily trying to hurt you, but they just frankly don't know any better. And in those moments, I find that it's you can sort of take it case by case, but it's easier to engage. Uh, and to have a conversation with somebody and say, hey, you know, let me just tell you, like, I know your intention is probably, was probably not bad, but that here's how that made me feel, you know, because that, that word actually has, has bad connotations uh, for people in my background, and this is what it, what it actually means. Um, so I think that's important too. Uh, the last thing I'll just say, though, is if you're with somebody else, you know, let's say you're, if you're an Asian American, somebody comes at you, directs a, you know, a slur, at you that that's you know offensive to all Asian Americans, and somebody is with you who's not Asian American. I think it's actually very important. Again, with safety in mind, that if it's a safe situation, it's important for them to say something uh, too, because I think the messages that come from people who are not of minority backgrounds about minority slurs are essential. You know, I think when when Grace is talking about the resolution in Congress, it it was important that they were members of Congress who were not Asian American who were supporting that and doing so publicly. And so that's not just true in Congress, but I think it's true on the streets, it's true in school, it's true in the workplace, that people you know, who may not be offended by these slurs need to also take responsibility and stand up and say, unless we're all standing up for each other and helping educate each other, uh, that these problems do not get better. That's incredible. We had a, we had a question here from, um, from Amy Chase asking, Specifically, how do we inform and educate our allies um, and champions to support our community right now? And you know, I, I think there's um, I think there's very tangible things. You know, like we know that Asian American businesses are seeing a decline that is not uh, that does not correlate to, to what other businesses are seeing. So if you're still ordering delivery, support an Asian business, support an Asian restaurant. Do do the thing because we know that there's a disparity there. So so do some things to help out. But and I think you spoke to to the importance of having allies at this time. So I just want to throw out if anyone has any other sort of quick tips on how to engage allies and get them to stand up for our communities as well. Sure, I will say as a minority, I think it's incredibly helpful, not just during these times, but, you know, under usual times to stand up for and support the concerns of other communities when they're maybe feeling that like they're under attack. You know, in Congress, we have something called the Tri Caucus or the Quad Caucus now, which is the Black Caucus, Hispanic Caucus, Asian Caucus, and Native American Caucus. And together, the numbers wise, we're actually a majority of the Democratic Caucus. And so I think it's important if there is an issue um, that the Black Caucus is dealing with, that the Asian Caucus is standing with them um, and in support. And with this resolution, for example, the Tri Caucus has been standing together, getting people to sign on, doing press conferences to make sure, like Dr. Murthy said, that it's not just Asian Americans standing up for each other, um, but other communities are, are demonstrating their, their friendship um, to, and making us stronger. 
That's great. I just want to make sure I get to a few more questions because I see we just have a few minutes left. So um, this was from um, John uh, Gunawan who says, what recommendations would you have for, um, for those who have been harassed but don't feel comfortable calling the police or fear that they might be, um, or, or have fear because they might be undocumented? Um, uh, I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on what we can be doing to support uh, our, our communities around that. Well, could you repeat the question just one more time? Yeah, it's um, what recommendations would you have for those who may have been harassed but do not feel comfortable calling the police or have fear because they might be undocumented? Um, I, I, I can throw out that we have a list on acttochange.org of a number of organizations that are tracking hate mm -hmm. crimes. And um, a lot of these organizations are very cognizant of these kinds of issues in our community. And I believe are safe spaces for, for you to report these incidences and could probably offer um, a liaison to, uh, uh, to say the government or to, to the police um, on your behalf. Um, so I would check out some of the some of the Asian American organizations that we have listed on on activechange.org. Um, I want to let me. There's one other question here. I just want to um, get to. There's so many. I'm so sorry, y'all. Y'all, we we didn't we don't have time to get to all of them. But um, um, well, let let me um. I think there's a question in here about uh, how should we be talking to teachers um, to get them to talk to their classrooms around these issues? I mean, I think- I, Yeah, please, Hudson, yeah. At least in my school, my school's pretty good about, you know, constantly checking up on their kids. We have a, a, a specific Zoom group, like, so that's always active and there's always like at least not, like a teacher there or someone there to watch over it. And if anything ever happens, you just report it there, right? I think the best thing to do for a teacher, like the best thing to tell your teacher to do is just make sure they're understanding of the situation, right? Uh, by doing this, the online program and stuff like that, you're putting a lot of trust and like responsibility into kids. And so making sure that you're there to support the kids, making sure they know that you're there to help them out no matter what is really powerful, even though you can't really like directly interact with them, just talking to them during class or after class. is something that's really helped out me and my uh like classmates uh, during this time of like, you know, uncertainty. That's a, I think that's, that's a fantastic tip to have a reporting feature that the teacher can then, can then respond to. Um, so we only have two minutes left. Um, our hope for every one of these COVID combos is to end it with something that we want to call the kindness table. Um, and, and the way we think of that kindness table is a place where parents and teachers and students can come together and do one one small thing today, you know, on this very day, um, that is an act of kindness. You know, at Act of Change, we, we truly believe that kindness is the antidote uh, to hate. Uh, being of service is a theme that I think all three of you spoke about so much today. So I just wanna ask each of you really quickly, um, uh, what is one thing someone at home can do today as an act of kindness? Uh, like, you know, telling your family members and friends, like how much they mean to you, how much like they love you, especially if it's someone that you don't get to talk to very often. My mother uh, is not like at the house with me because she's working at the hospital. And so like one thing that I can do to kind of show my care and love and not and be kind is just, you know, calling her every day. And, you know, my grandmothers, they write me letters, right? Like to tell me how they're doing and to like just kind of check in with me, respond to those letters or writing letters of your own to people. And personally, I think letters are a lot more heartfelt, right? They kind of, you know, they're your, they're your own handwriting, your own signature. So I think one thing you can do to be really nice is, you know, write a letter to someone who's important to you to show that you care. That's amazing. I'll pass it off to you, uh, Dr. Murthy or Congresswoman Mang. Uh, either one of you, sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a really beautiful idea, Hudson. I, I love that. Um, I know it feels like nobody writes letters anymore, but they're really powerful when you get them. I think it's all the more special because people don't write letters as often. Yeah, I cried. <laughs> yeah. One, of the, one thing I might suggest also is, um, is simply calling up somebody that you, that you love and asking them how they're doing and then actually listening for what they have to say. The reason I, I say this is because deep listening is an art that's rapidly being lost. 
But there's deep power and great healing in being able to listen fully uh, and deeply to somebody and to truly hear what they're saying. You know, one of the greatest gifts that we can give somebody else is the gift of our full attention. And all of us have experienced that. Like when you've got a friend or a family member who's focused on you and listening to you when you're talking, it feels really good. And it feels really different from when you're having a conversation with a friend who's kind of distracted, who's sort of, you know, watching TV in the background and is, uh, you know, doing something on their phone. And you can kind of tell when people aren't fully present or when you're having some dinner with somebody even in person, but they're kind of distracted by alerts that are going off on their phone. Um, but it feels really good, you know, when you give somebody your full attention. You know, a lot of times we ask people how you are and then we just move on to the next sentence. Like we just don't even wait, <laughs> you know, it's almost automatic. Um, but I do think that in this moment in particular, when a lot of people are, you know, are trying to figure out how to adjust to this new normal and are, are struggling, simply asking people how they're doing and then and listening, uh, I think that is a gift that we can give everyone and we all have the power to do that. Thank you for that. That is, that is beautiful. Um, Congressman Meng? So my idea is not something that I thought of, but one of my constituents started this sort of um, project in her apartment building where every family or, you know, every student, for example, can be captain of a floor of an apartment or even a neighborhood, your neighborhood block. And maybe every two or three days, you can check on one person or you can check on another family or two, see how they're doing, calling them like Dr. Murthy said, or if you are capable of doing it um, to get groceries for them, you know, ask them if, if there's anything they need. And it's particularly helpful for families that have elderly people in them or families of people who are essential workers who have to work and may not be able to provide uh, enough time and resources for their own families. So just to sort of be like a, a captain and check in on the people around you. I love that. What a great way to also to make someone feel really useful. To like, what a great way to empower someone. That's, that's fantastic. I would say, um, this is good. This is so promotional in a way, but I would say an act of kindness that you can do um, today that's so easy is go to the Act to Change uh, website. We actually have a pledge on there that you can take that just says that you commit to stand up, uh, to standing up against bullying. We also have um, so many resources on places to report hate incidences, uh, hotlines to call, crisis hotlines, suicide hotlines. Um, we also uh, are really proud to support so many campaigns like Wash the Hate and Hate is a Virus and Racism is a Virus. And I would encourage you all to, um, to check out those campaigns on social media because not only do they spread positivity on social media, but they're also gaining um, a lot of traction in, in the larger news outlets. So they're actually getting the word out in a, in a, in a very um, real way. And I just, I just wanna say thank you so much to everybody who joined on today. And thank you so much to this incredible panel. You guys are all so, so um, busy and doing such meaningful work at this time. And so I just wanna say thank you so much for making the time to do this and to give back to, um, to these communities, to our community in, the, in this way. And I just wanna close out with um, Governor Mom? Cuomo. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Oh, sorry, before you close that, could I just share one, one quick thought? Please, I, please. I just wanted to say, just like listening to you and listening to Hudson and Congresswoman Meng, like I feel so proud of this community and of how like people are standing up and, and serving as examples, you know, to other people. and knocking down barriers by showing that we can occupy spaces that we otherwise haven't been seen to occupy. You know, like you and Hudson have, have opened doors for people in the world of media and entertainment that people thought were just sealed shut. Um, Congresswoman Meng has, gosh, she's opened up doors for millions of people who never thought that an Asian American could succeed and lead in Congress, including my own, you know, my own wife, Alice Chen. Uh, I remember the first time Alice met uh, Congresswoman Meng, um, you know, we've been trying to get my, my wife, Alice, to think about running for office forever. She's like, no, I could never do that. And I still remember that night that we came back from that event with Congresswoman Meng. She, Alice just had this look in her eye and I said, well, tell me what you're thinking. She's like, well, I looked, I looked at Grace and I thought, wow, she looks like me. And she just kept saying that she looks like me. And the message behind that was maybe somebody like me, like Alice could also run for Congress one day. So it just, and, and finally, you know, with Act to Change and just when organizations like this, you know, led by Asian Americans stand up for not just Asian Americans, 
but stand up for justice and stand up for treating each other well. I think that also sends a message to all of us in the community that we can be leaders in the fight for justice and that we can serve not just our own community, but all communities. So I just want to thank you, uh, Malik, in particular, and the leadership of Act to Change and thank Hudson and Congresswoman Meng as well for just knocking down those barriers and, and serving as role models. And I just, I feel so proud of our community right now. We're proud of you too. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah. Thank you. And you know, I should on that note also say that this event today did not did not come together without a ton of work from um, the incredible team at Act to Change who literally put this together in a matter of days. And so I'm so thankful that for, for them and so also for the number of organizations that came out to support and um, promote our work. Um, so grateful to all of you. And I just, I just wanted to close with this, this, this quote that I read from Governor Cuomo that he said in response to a hate crime against an Asian American woman in New York. Um, sorry, this makes me, this actually all of it makes me pretty emotional, but he said, um, to be clear, there is zero evidence that people of Asian descent bear any additional responsibility for the transmission of the coronavirus. No one should ever feel intimidated or threatened because of who they are or how they look. Diversity is our greatest strength and in difficult times we need to band together even tighter. So it means a lot to me that so many people came here today to band together even tighter. So thank you, thank you so much. Together uh, we, can, we can definitely put an end to bullying and hate. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you.